I don't want it. Okay, good. You have to say the whole thing. Okay. Good evening, everyone out there in TV land. I'd like to welcome you to the 1,233rd meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington. Recording Secretary Gary Hevel, would you please read the minutes from the last regular meeting? I will. <laughs> President Lourdes Chamorro, call to order the 1,232nd regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington on the 1st of December 2022. The last meeting of the year is also considered to be the annual business meeting. The hybrid meeting included 15 in-person attendees at room WG33 and the National Museum of Natural History and 40 virtual visitors. Recording Secretary Gary Hevel read the minutes of November and these were approved by the audience. President Chamorro presented the customary end of the year starting with the sentiment that it was an honor to serve as president. The national COVID pandemic that began in 2020 forced the society to shift from in-person meetings to virtual meetings. The advantage of virtual meetings permitted larger numbers, number of attendees. The executive committee of the society met virtually eight times during the past year. Development of the new website was chiefly due to President Chimoro. Program Chairman Alan Norbaum provided extra service to his position, arranging virtual connections with help from Cecilia Escobar for monthly presentations. In October 2022, the Society began to them while retaining virtual connections. Monthly presentations included speakers, Don Art. Kyle Bang, Yvonne Linton, Will Kuhn, Jeff Stevenson, Matt Bertoni, and Ryan St. Moret. For the annual banquet in June, President elect Matt Buffington gained and cartoonist Jay Hosler. Matt also assembled individuals for the auditing and officer nominating committees. Editor Mark Metz had a challenging year partly due to a change of publishers for the journal. 54 articles with a total of 692 pages were completed and an issue devoted to Ray Garnet was finished. In June, curator Nick Silverson returned to academic studies and Alyssa Seaman filled that position. Abigail Kula contended with financial matters and is currently finishing the report for the auditing committee. Gary Hevel continued his long-standing service as recording secretary. Membership and communication secretary Elizabeth Young kept records on new members. The list of new officers for the year 2023 presented last month were read for approval by society members. The slate of officers were approved by vote and consist of President Matt Buffington, Program Chair Alan Nurbaum, Editor Mark Metz, Treasurer Abigail Kula, Membership and Communication Secretary Elizabeth Young, Curator Alyssa Seaman, President elect Don Weber, and Recording Secretary Gary Hill. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the Speaker of the Union, Ryan St. Laurent from Cornell University, whose presentation was titled Phylogenomics of Notodontidae. Dr. St. Laurent first noted that he was influenced and mentored by James Miller for studies in notodontids. A low estimate of the numbers of species of the family is 4,500. They are worldwide in distribution and highly variable. Dr. St. Laurent discussed previous taxonomic studies of notodontids and then presented recent approaches of phylogenomics. 
He discussed differences among the subfamilies and presented dramatic images of the beauty and bizarreness of notodontic caterpillars. The family requires and deserves further attention. At the end of the evening, the society gavel was passed by the order of tomorrow to new president Matt Buffington. The meeting was adjourned at 8.32 p.m. Thank you, recording secretary Gary Hubble. Can I get a motion to approve the one correction? Yes. One correction. Yes. Ryan is not at Cornell. He is here. He's a postdoc here. I should have noted that. I will. No problem. So ordered. So, so noted. So it is written. So it shall be. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, corrections? Move that we accept the minutes. Second. Second. So moved. <laughs> Thank you, recording secretary Gary Hubble. Um, President elect Don Weber, do you have anything to report from your position? Did you put me on notice that you were going to call or anything? No, that's <laughs> not it. it's part of how we roll. Oh, and it's no, 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 thank you, President Matt Lockheed. I have nothing to say at this time. However, I'd like to mention that I spent the morning cleaning up my flooded office okay. up in Beltsville. <laughs> so I'm glad you all are here. There is nice and dry. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Treasurer Abby Kula is is she online? Uh, Abby, if you're there, would you like to make any report? Yeah. Hearing nothing, uh, I move to program chair Alan Orbaum. Would you like to have anything to report to the society? Oh, well, we have one participant tonight from Bangladesh. Wow, Which I think could be a first. That's a first. Excellent. Excellent. Are are those guys unmuted? You can hear them if they want to say anything, right? Oh, we're gonna do introduction of visitors and such later. But no, you were asking Abby, like for example, if she wanted to say anything, but I'm not sure if yeah, she I'm whether we can hear it. I'm unmuted. Yeah. She can unmute. Okay. Um Elizabeth or uh, Alyssa Seaman, our curator, is not here, she's uh, ill, but I will make a mention that. We are going to be reorganizing the archive room in the entomology library where we store back issues of proceedings with the help of Jerry Conlon, who has surplus barrister bookcases for us. And, uh, we'll, I'll be helping. And if anyone wants to help lift heavy boxes of journals and put them away, I would love to have your help. Uh, editor, editor Mark Metz, are you online? Would you like to say anything? I take that as a no. Uh, media and communications. I don't think that's a position we really have anymore, is it? Well, recording secretary. <laughs> that's okay, officially membership secretary. And here. Okay. Do <laughs> you have anything to report? Uh, yes, I do. Excellent. Uh, we uh, have two new members to announce this meeting uh, Michael Bernal and Laura Bainfor. Uh, and we have three official members that were announced in the December meeting, uh, Zachary Dankowitz, uh, Cynthia Weinman, and Michael Andrew Jackson. Excellent. Uh, and if anyone in uh, present here in person today is visiting, uh, or if someone on the Zoom call would like to say hello, we'd love to hear from you and uh, know who's uh, visiting. I think we all know each other here. Anyone on the on the Zoom call like to raise your virtual hand and say hello? Well, Naeem from Bangladesh says, by the way, I'm a member of the society. I'm visiting my family. Oh, there's two hands. Two hands, Matthew. Okay. Oh, there's Mark Hoddle. How do I get you? Hi, everybody from California. Welcome. I know a bunch of you. It's good to see you. Um, thanks, Don Weber, for sending out the flyer. I didn't know Lourdes was speaking today. And we're actually writing an annual review article together on palm weevils. So should have been told about this. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I see Romano Falero's here. He's in Goa, India right now. He's also on the palm weevil team. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And Walter. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, 
I'm from Rockville, Maryland. It's always a pleasure to attend this meeting. I'm an amateur uh, entomologist. I go out and collect insects during the spring, summer, and fall, and roam the woods. So uh, I'm very happy to be part of the society and to listen in and learn new stuff all the time, all the time. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Romino. Hi, I'm, I'm Romano Palero. I collaborate with Mark Hoddle. I'm sitting in Goa, India. It's 5.30 in the morning here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That is awesome. Thank you for, for, for joining. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, if I may, uh, just one more announcement. Uh, that time of year to renew your memberships, uh, we are transitioning to the new website uh, and there will be an email coming out shortly uh, with instructions how to, as we're going through this transition, but it uh, should be pretty similar to what you've done in past years, just a different uh, kind of layout, but it, it yeah. Uh, so thank you for your patience as uh, we uh, get ready to uh, transition to the new website. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one more visitor with their hands up, uh, Alex. <clears throat> Greetings uh, from Miami, Florida. Um, I uh, used to be an intern at the Systematic Entomological La uh, Laboratory in 2019. Uh, I'm just very excited to be participating in these meetings again. Very excited for today's lecture. Awesome, thank you for joining us. Also a chat message for you, I'm leaving. Zavala from Chile. Oh, okay. Covering the globe. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, it is a international society we have here. Um, okay. We've already done new numbers, etc. Is there any unfinished business from the last meeting? That would be new business presented at the last meeting that was not closed. I think the website for how it's done. Okay. Um, we'll, just, we'll be sending out the email and then that'll be the end. Yeah, so for people that may not be hearing clearly online, I don't know exactly where that microphone is in here, but is it, it's, it's in that device. Yeah. Okay, so the um, website's being totally renovated after 12 solid years of, of work uh, of, on the old one. And as a, as a consequence, the database, membership database had to be, has to be created from scratch again. So everyone who is currently a member is going to have to renew. And anyone who is yet to renew, just wait until you are called. And it's very easy, very simple. Um, and once it's done, then we don't have to be doing it. Doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. Go away. All previous dads are given. Because you won't have any. No. Oh, no. We have. We have. <laughs> Okay, for everyone out there in Zoom land, could you please mute yourselves while we're meeting here? We're getting some remarkable feedback. <laughs> okay, any new business? I have some. So um, I would like to uh, begin the formal introduction of some events in the society outside of the regular meetings, the annual meeting and the banquet. Um, since the society is, is deeply entrenched in Washington, DC, there's a lot of history here. I'd like to explore a few things that are of entomological interest. Uh, one being, um, <laughs> I actually want to try to do a, a walking field trip to C.B. Riley's house, yes. which is still yeah. standing on our street, which is where the first meeting actually took place. And the president-elect was author of... Yes. And exactly. I also did some research on the... He built more than just that. So in the DC database, if, um, I, I just happened to run when I was unfolding my sodden office. So some research on that. And uh, he, built, he was kind of a minor... Tycoon. He built yeah. several townhouses. Very nice. That's right. I remember reading this. Yeah. I remember reading that in your book. That's right. So anyway, actually, so 
his residence, it would be great if we could gain access. Yeah, yes. but it's been condoized. It was a yeah. quite a quite a nice place. Yeah, and it's been chopped up. And I entertain you know anybody's ideas for how best to contact people and start that process. I was just going to knock at his door. Yeah, well, you could do that. Um, I don't know. There's yeah. always a risk that you might piss them off or sure. something. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention, and maybe in this context, is um, probably some of you know the Entomological Society of America will be meeting next November at National Harbor, which, by the way, is neither national nor a harbor, but it is <laughs> close by. It's in it's in Prince George's County, Maryland. And we might think of some kind of host society type activities or tours that might be of interest. And, you know, I, I'm on the governing board, so we can, you know, shovel right. those ideas at them. Um, and they can say yes or no, but we can also just show up and do stuff too. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, another idea was just um, uh, kind of a general field day. We have lots of great areas around here that we could get general permits for. Um, something we've thought about for a really long time, and I think it'd be really fine to finally drop the clutch on it and, and actually do it. So those are just some ideas. Those are, that's the only kind of new business I have. Um, with that, we now move on to the presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. <laughs> Does anyone have anything they would like to share with the society at this moment? I do. Yeah, I Okay, I can't pass these around for reasons just explained. Um, this is part of the Buren Fire Ant Collection. Buren was uh, working with ARS to find the origin of red imported fire ant, where it was native to. He's the one who named Solenopsis invicta. Uh, the collection uh, was supposed to be deposited here, and it kind of never really made it here. <laughs> now it's all here. After putting lots of pieces together and contacting lots of people, the collection is now on two very neat shelves that's going to be rehoused. Um, this is obviously not uh, USNM standard, so we're going to be rehousing and everything. And we have all the code books that go with the vials, so we know exactly what's in the vial. And we're going to be using this to build uh, uh, authoritative genetic database to figure out what exactly is a red important fire ant. So this is like eight years of me trying to push this to finally make it happen. So totally stuck. I had to share. It. <laughs> Anything Bravo. else out there in Zoom land? Hearing nothing, I'll turn the floor over to program chair, Alan Norbaum. Are we just here for if you want to examine, but do be where these are just popping off, so just be a little careful. Okay. Um, when Matt called on me before, I should have mentioned that our speaker. Oh, your mic? Oh, no. It's going through there, I think. Uh, our speaker next uh, month is Bob Kimsey from UC Davis. Yeah. Uh, he's talking something about Alcatraz. I forget. He didn't what? give me the full text. I'm sure that will be very interesting. Um, and we have uh, 39 Zoom participants tonight. Keeping track of that. Um, and now I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, who doesn't really need introductions since she is our past president. But um, uh, she is Lourdes Chamorro, and she earned her PhD on the systematics of neotropical caddisflies from the University of Minnesota with Carol Holzenthal. Um, she began her lifelong interest in beetle research as a postdoc at the Smithsonian and the USDA. She currently serves as research entomologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service, uh, conducting systematics research on agriculturally important weevils. Um, 
She has published more than 40 peer-reviewed papers and participated in expeditions to Bolivia, Chile, China, Dominican Republic, France, Hawaii, well, the whole list. <laughs> um, she is president of the Animal Logic Society of Washington, president-elect of the Coleopterus Society, um, member of the Washington Biologist Field Club and the Nicaraguan Academy of Sciences. She's also section editor for Weevils for the Coleopterus Bulletin. She lives in Potomac, Maryland with her husband, Matt Buffington, and daughter, Petra, who is also with us in the audience tonight. Welcome, Petra. And she has numerous hobbies, including growing bonsai, Japanese kintsugi, sake tasting, gardening with native plants, quilting, and is currently assistant scoutmaster of Boy Scout Troop 255G in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, I don't know how you do all that. <laughs> Thank you, Al. I sh yeah, I should mention also Al is my supervisor and has a postdoc there. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a great honor, especially as I'm a president, past president of ESW, one of the great uh, servants for the society. And as I was getting ready to present um, this talk, I, I decided that I should talk about it. Something that I've been working on for the past 10 years. Um, I worked on you know, tropical caddisflies. And so um, this is sort of like the trajectory that I've taken um, as I've worked with weevils and um, how that went. And so I also have to say that Al did a wonderful job with the flyer. And uh, there's a, a, a beautiful illustration by uh, Joel Floyd, who's here in the audience. And then uh, Bob Anderson's description of a new species of Rotobinus, so it's also a trichlorine. Uh, named after it, so uh, it was great. Okay, advanced. So when we think about, um, so one thing that I want to say is that one, when, when I'm talking about dry flooring, it's going to take a lot of different uh, trajectories and different avenues, just because it never is just a straight line when I'm doing the research, and there's something that I just cannot ignore. So. My talk is going to go a little bit like that. It's going to go a little bit straight, but then I'm going to take a, a few deviations here and there, but it's all going to be around dry thorine research. And when we think about dry thorines, um, we first think about perhaps ring coffers and the red palm weevil. And some of you might remember in 2010, um, there was um, a, a reported a red palm weevil in uh, California. And some of my colleagues who actually helped eradicate that weevil from California are um, on this uh, talk or in this Zoom meeting. And this is a devastating pest that attacks uh, living and stressed uh, palms. And it would uh, affect the multi million dollar date industry in California. So it was a huge deal. Here are some pictures of, of, of what this looks like this giant, uh, nasty, as Mark Hoddle put it, uh, weevil. And um, it's very, very um, polymorphic, as you can see here. So it's it's extremely devastating to to palms, and one of the the reasons that it is devastating is because it feeds on more than twenty four different species. Um, in places where it has established, it's it's originally from uh, Southeast Asia, and in places where it has established, it just completely devastates. All the palms that that it uh, that it encounters, and you see this sort of flopping of the palms, uh, as you see on, on the lower right picture. And what's interesting about this this weevil as well is that some people consider it really tasty. And in fact, if you look at the jars in our collection here, you walk in there, and my mouth actually starts watering <laughs> because they do look kind of tasty. Haven't um, you eaten? <laughs> no, I haven't. You but haven't? I know some people who have. <laughs> um, but I, I also wanted to show some of that and um, and. Maybe some uh, Mark can correct me, but I think that one of the reasons and one of the ways that it was introduced into California was because they wanted to continue to propagate the the weevil and um, and and continue to feed. But that now has been eradicated, and it was a um, concerted effort by state, local, federal, university uh, individuals and programs that just put pheromone traps out and, and uh, completely eradicated the red palm weevil. Um, but now there's a new rincophorus that um, 
might be of concern or is of concern, and that's the South American palm weevil, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. So yes, so the palm weevil has been eradicated. As you can see, the name, so Rincoffers perigineus is how it was originally categorized or, or identified by some of the work that Rickman Jones did and, and colleagues, um, molecular and, and work. Actually, it's another species that would used to be a synonym. So Rincoffers vulneratus now eradicated. So Rincoffers belongs to the dry therine. And for a long time, dry therines were thought were actually Rincoforini. So some of you might be familiar with that name. Um, and they were considered in their own family, so Rincoforidae. But some of the work that McKenna has done on the higher level of phylogenetics of, of, of weevils, actually, um, they're, they're embedded deep within, or not deep within, but within the, the, the weevils, the Bufoleonidae, and that has been also supported by other uh, subsequent research, um, molecular, molecular work as well. But in this particular study, we find that the dry therine might not actually be monophyletic, but some of the subsequent research actually does uh, find them to be monophyletic. And um, with the chronogram, uh, it's estimated that the A uh, dry therine, um, they diverged about uh, between 65 and 150 million years ago. And one of the interesting things about dry therines is that their sister to is the platypodine. And that was something that was very surprising uh, when some of these molecular studies started to come out because there are these tiny uh, scolotine bark beetle looking things, um, but, but that's consistently been recovered um, to be the case. So here's a, some of you here and can't see because of the uh, uttering of it. So dry therine, um, it's a subfamily that's monophyletic. It consists of uh, 1,200 species and a little bit more than 153 genera. We've had a few more recent uh, new genera described, and they're classified in five tribes. And you can see that this is more or less the size range that you find with Brythorine. So you've had some really tiny uh, Drythorus uh, to the gigantic uh, Mahakamia with a really elongate uh, four legs. Uh, but what's interesting about dry therines is that just with a lot of weevils, we don't know uh, the limits of some of the genera, uh, the relationships and the phylogeny. We don't, we don't have a, an idea of what, uh, what's going on there, whether even some of the tribes, subtribes are monophyletic. One of the things that we do know is that it is a monophyletic group. And one of the very easy to distinguish characters is the antennal club. And it's a glabrous uh, little structure here. And so that's a sure way to, to kind of distinguish a dry chlorine weevil uh, from any other weevil. So I'm going to be showing this sort of way I, I like to visualize the classification of dry chlorine. So um, as the five tribes, so there's the Rincoferini in the purple, the Cryptodermatini in the blue, the orthonectini in the orange, the dryferini in the pink, and the strombocerini in the red. So that's the five tribes. And then within that, um, we have the different tribes. So Rincoferina for the Rincoferini, and we have the Dicylandrini in the green, and so on. Um, and then the different genera. So the Spenophorina is the most diverse of the, the uh, dry chlorines. So I'll be using this, and it kind of helps me visualize. The, the classification and the diversity of dry thorines. So dry thorines specialized almost entirely on monocots um, and they can be devastating pests. So uh, a lot of different commodities like banana, cow, pineapple, sugar cane. Uh, but then we have Cetophilus that likes, uh, it's a pest of stored grains. And then we have a few deviations from the monocot sort of um, idea right with this group and then we have uh Pesiporinus, and it feeds on stress or or uh cycads it's in south africa and then the cryptodermatini and for the longest time we didn't even know what kind of plant it it fed on what was its host plant and when we were in taiwan um i had looked at some photographs of individuals from my naturalists and so on and they consistently image cryptodermatini on ferns. 
And so I said, well, let's try to find some, some grottos and some fern grottos. And then we did, and we actually put a trap there. And I tried dissecting out some fern roots and so on, but I couldn't find them. But um, we, we think that that's potentially their, their host plant. So the Cryptodermatini, this is a kind of a little bizarre group that we were interested in collecting some specimens in order to um, include in our collection. <coughs> so because of their interest in these monocots, which are uh, commodities that we are interested in, and they are intercepted at ports of entry. And part of my responsibility with systematic entomology laboratory and with the USDA is to provide the ultimate identification for weevils that are intercepted at ports of entry. So on a daily basis, I might get, uh, I don't know, three free weevils and several of those are thorax. And the USDA has the system of prioritizing uh, their pests and they cat categorize them under A or B pests. Um, the A pests are deemed to be the highest priority. These are the ones that are of, of, of greatest threat. Um, there are either an eradication programs. So you do not want these. Uh, the, all the alarms go off if you have any of these kinds of pests. Uh, bee pests are kind of similar to that, but uh, we don't have as much information and we, un we don't understand the host range and so on, but they might be of concern. So um, in the A category, we have nine beetles and of those four weevils, two of those are gryothorines. So the red palm weevil and the South American palm weevil. So Rhynchophorus virginius, uh, probably vulneratus as well, so it probably should be free. Rhynchophorus palmarum. And on the B category, we have 30 beetles, 16 of which are weevils, and one of them is Arabdocellus obscurus, which is the New Guinea sugarcane weevil. So, and just to give you an idea of um, what some of the expert, the SEL weevil experts since 1980 have had to deal with in terms of interceptions and what comes through, that 20, more than 20,000 Cochlearnoidea have been intercepted. Uh, and identified by SEL experts. 12% uh, of them have been dry thorans. And of those 32 genera of dry thorans um, have been identified. And this is a work that I was interested in just to understand what is it that coming, what kind of dry thorans are coming into our border. So again, we have the, the classification and the diversity. And I made this sort of cloud map, uh, kind of a word cloud map of the genera and the number of interceptions that, that we've had on our borders and which ones are the ones that are intercepted most commonly. And we have Metamasius, uh, Spinophorus, Cytophilus, Trifetus, it's being some of the most commonly intercepted. Uh, so like I said before, 32 genera, and you can see that they're all over the place. We have them even in the Strombosorini in the red and the dry Thorini in the pink. So just to give, some, some kind of idea of what some of these are doing. So this is Cetophilus. Um, and these go all the way back to Egyptian times. So they've been associated with humans for a really, really long time. Um, this is an interesting group because apparently they do not have this, the endosymbionts that some of the other um, striathorines uh, possess. Um, so, so those are, it's an interesting group. In that picture, we were actually collecting them from rice in one of the farms that we visited in Taiwan. Uh, the third most frequently encountered drive thorine is um, Trifetus incarnatus, and uh, we consistently get it on this herbaceous uh, seed pot, and we didn't even know what the larva pupae looked like, and it's from Southeast Asia, but what's great about having them in these seed pots and the fact that we intercept them is that we actually do have now the larvae and the pupae, so uh, that's another uh, thing that I'll be talking a little bit about, but that's that's also so this these interceptions are also a fantastic source of material for doing for doing molecular work and for doing some um, life history associations and so on. And there's another cetophilus that also feeds on herbaceous um, pods. And the other thing about interceptions is that you you do have an ability to more or less determine when they're active, um, that could also be when things are shipped to the United States, but uh, we, we do get kind of a map, but that could also help us on this side of the globe understand and manage the pests that are coming. So this was my attempt to try to understand uh, Dryothorus and Dryothorines uh, coming to our borders. Again, 
Vesperinus was uh, some some of the dry florins that we intercept, and these are from plants that are coming in. These are ornamentals coming in from South Africa, and these do kill um, these plants once they're they're stressed. And we have some orchid feeders, and we have uh, a, a very big pest in China, the Nasophasus. And we didn't know what the larvae looked like of these, but the, there, there were some larvae at the BM. And we had fresh material that we could include in the molecular analysis. And the um, Trochorophallus, which is also another orchid associated dry chlorine. And it's been reported to also be pest of uh, sugarcane. And then you get things like this that nobody can identify. Um, they're coming in from India, in this case, and the seeds of these palms, um, at least most of the reports that, were, that we've been getting from the, the, the data from interceptions. And uh, when I came to the collection, it was just as uh, Rinko Farini, possibly at Parfe, we confirmed this from some of the research that I've done. And nobody had any specimens of these except for the ones that were in the type collection of the museums. And then again, another Rinko Farini. So I mentioned before that that's, that was uh, dry thorns, and these are coming in from Africa, and nobody knew what these look, look like at all, uh, or what they what they were. So when I was trying to find a, a research program, I thought that dry thorns were the perfect uh, group. They weren't gigantic like the molotines or the cryptorynchines. Uh, they were manageable, 153 genera, uh, 1,200 species. Um, they were economically important and um, they're very quite quite interesting. So um, I decided to to embark on this monographic revision of the entire world fauna, and I continue to to do that. So I began with uh, the phylogeny of the Dryophorini, uh, along with just understanding what the genera look like and so on. And we need to start with a stable classification, um, as well as understanding what the host plants are, and then we can begin to make predictions. Um, about several things like uh, what plants they might be coming in, what are some of the host plants, natural enemies, um, but potentially even invasiveness. Are there some groups in the phylogeny that uh, we tend to see coming in more regularly? Um, or, yeah, so, so kind of questions like that. And there were, before, before this attempt, there were other phylogenies, um, but they were just restricted to particular lineages within the Dryopharini. So we had Gravenikov working on the Stromposterini. Uh, Omira, he did a, a phylogeny, but that was for his uh, undergraduate at Harvard, and it's not published yet, but that, um, that was actually quite good. And then morphology, morphological study on the Orthodectini. But this was the most comprehensive study uh, a lot of the material was from interceptions um, that I had identified. And so we included representatives of all five tribes um, within in all subtribes, except for an African group, the Omatalampini uh, in the green, bright green. And then there's a putative African group that, that we just uh, don't have specimens, but now we do to include. So, um, what I did was uh, we sequenced uh, two genes, the 18S and 28S uh, RNA, and I aligned them using secondary structure. Uh, analyzed it with Bayesian and maximum likelihood inference. And then I paired up with my colleague Bruno de Maderos, and um, he did the divergence time estimation for this particular phylogeny. And so what we did was we used fossils uh, uh, a fossil calibrated relaxed clock model. So, and, and he used two different methods. So, he used this no dating and this fossilized birth death model. Uh, one just uses like a few fossils, and then the fossilized birth death uses all the available fossils that you that you have. Um, so, then we, we looked into the liter literature. There were a few new additions to this uh, to this list uh, later on <laughs> when we were doing the our phylogeny, but um, but that was part of part of the uh, the addition of the fossils. So what did we find? <coughs> this is um, the Bayesian topology of the of our study, and we have a monophyletic Dryopharini. So what we have here is the circles is a greater than ninety five percent posterior probability. So 
that's a strong support for those particular plates. Um, and I've tried to maintain more or less the same colors that I was using in that classification. So one of the uh, striking things about what we found was that the tribe Rincoporini does not want a phyletic. So that was the, that's the, the, the biggest tribe in the dry of the Rhines. Um, we have them pulling out um, up here, um, but this is not very well supported. Um, so, so this is something that we're, we're continuing to explore with Bruno. We have uh, Spinifarina and Cyphophorus coming out down here, and then the Lithosamina um, that includes the Cytophilus, so also pulling out, um, not with the rest of the brain. Uh, a plate that's very important to us is the, the plate that contains Brancophorus. And so we have these two genera, Cosmopolides um, and Proteoptes, that were Spinifarina falling out with the Rincoporina, so with Rincoporus. And in this one particular study, we find that Rincoporus is not monophyletic. So we have Rincoporus parentatus, and um, it's rendered, Rincoporus rendered paraphyletic by Streptotarchelis and Dynamis. So that's something that we want to explore a lot um, further. And then Stromboserini and Drytherini. And this is a question that with Grobenica we've been trying to explore. And is it's whether Nepheus should be included in its own tribe, or if we should just combine Stromboserini with Drytherini and Nepheus and just have a single tribe. These are all the tiny little Drytherines. And then this Cryptodermatini, the ones that are associated with ferns, uh, that Potentially, we, we don't quite know yet. We haven't confirmed it, but we weren't we weren't sure where it fell. It's never been included in any uh, phylogenetic study, but we have uh, potentially falling out sister to the Polytini and Lithosomia. So um, that's the results for that. In terms of the divergence time estimation, what we found um, with that was that there's a very large gap between the divergence of the sister group of the dry chlorines. Uh, the platypodiony about 100 million years, and that the diversification of the dry thorines was during the, the Cenozoic uh, about 66 million years ago. And this uh, highlights the role that the uh, coevolution had with the androsperms, or this group it had with, with androsperms. And then one of the interesting things about um, including age in, in your phylogenies, right? Like understanding when things uh, diverged. Um, is that perhaps you might be able to use that data to determine what biological control agents you should use. And this is a paper that Matt Buffington published in 2014, and he goes into a very nice detail. But do you want to pick a parasitoid that is in an older lineage or one that's in, in a younger lineage? And what are the benefits of, of those? And, and so that's something that hasn't really been explored, but that could be something that you could look into if you have uh, chronograms to, to, to test that. So once, uh, so we've looked into that for, for Stryphorini, the, the first phylogeny. And, but I think that there's still some gaps in, in data and we want to add a lot more taxa. We, we don't have some of the key um, subtribes from Africa that we want to include, and we want to just expand um, the taxonal sampling, and then we're using anchored hybrid enrichment, and this is being led now by Bruno de Madero. So as part of the monographic revision, I continue on with a detail, detailed study of uh, the morphology of not just the adults, but also the immatures, and, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about that. But, Another part of the revision is to um, track down the types. So of those 152 genera of dried variety, many of them were described by authors, um, European authors, more than 100 years ago, and their collections are in Europe. So um, I, I went to various collections in Dresden, France, and the United Kingdom to track down the types, understand what the concepts were of these different genera. And one place that I dedicate a lot of time to is the Natural History Museum in London, and it has more than 100,000 beetle types. And one of the things that I, that I do, apart from spending a lot of time there, is that 
various institutions, you're not allowed to borrow more than 12 types, but if they have you know, 20 types, then I just bring along this, this imaging system and it won't replace dissections and carefully studying of types, but sometimes you don't even know what they look like. So a third of the dry thorium genera, we didn't even know what they looked like. So um, just imaging them and making it available to, to other researchers and to yourself um, helps a lot. So we bring along this, this imaging system. And at, in London, they have a, um, a huge, what we call addenda collection. So things that have been collected over decades. And so in the last trip I did, right before the pandemic, this is me trying to sort out all of their dry chlorine uh, material that hasn't been identified. And at one point I came across this one, um, three or four specimens. And immediately I wrote to Bob Anderson. And I said, Bob, this is a really, really bizarre looking orthonoxini. Um, it has this, 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 and this. I don't, I've never seen anything like this. Um, so we looked into it, we uh, compared it. I, I, I sent them, you know, I borrowed the material. And it turns out that it's a new genus of orthonoxini close to um, the bearded uh, weevil. So we, we named it in honor of Varisha. Uh, uh, we named it Varisha in honor of Patricia uh, Bari. She did several revisions of um, several dry flora and genera, metamassies and um, spinophoras, and how to name for Anne Howden, uh, her special issue. So that was a, an, an awesome find and uh, cooperated with Bob Anderson, who has been doing a lot of research on dry thoriony, but mostly in the neotropical region. And so we, we, we have this collaboration where I didn't necessarily step on his toe, but we were just collaborating on this and uh, working on different faunas. And then we have field work. So here's again, some of the Taiwanese um, field work that we did and discovering what some of the host plants uh, are of some of these uh, weevils. So these are, this is Spenacorinus and they actually go into these leaf rolls of uh, what looked to be like a ginger plant. Um, and so we tried to take photographs of the plants. Um, in this case, we have a few more spinifarina that we collected. And the codes there is how um, keep track for the molecular data and data management. As I said before, there's a, um, there's a group that is really tiny within the dry florins, and they're the dry florini and the strombosorini. And those, the best way to get them is by sifting leaf litters and then running them through these uh, wing flares. And so that's me at the top in California. And then at the bottom there, and French Guyana, and then Taiwan on the right, uh, trying to collect some of these things. So Nephews is right on, on the right in 9991. Uh, and some other groups as well, sorry. And more recently, we, we went to Panama with Bruno, Matt, and we, this time it was a slightly different way of collecting, um, where we really tried to focus on the host plants and try to gain a real understanding of what some of these dry chlorines are feeding on. Um, we found a few larvae, on some plants, and interestingly enough, a lot of them are not monocots. So in this case, we have um, some in the pepper family. Um, so that's that's kind of a, an interesting thing. And we actually dissected out the larvae; um, they were in there. And then we tried a few new methods. So um, this is a V on the left is the V F I C, so V shaped light intercept trap. And um, so you only see kind of the, the front of it, but the side is shaped like a V. And this, we tried it just right at the end of our trip. And we, we got all of the materials very quickly from the, the hardware store. The, the trays at the bottom aren't the best, but they worked. And the amount of material that we, we got was just amazing. We only ran it for two days and we got some dry chlorines that we, we didn't get any other way. So for now, from now on, that's that's the method that we're employing while we, when we go into the field. Um, I can provide information on the paper for that. So B F I T, and then again we did we did the leaf litter sifting, and then Matt ran some malaise traps, and then at the bottom that's Bruno, the Maderos, and um, one of the things that he does is that he takes photographs of the the plants. And he uploads them when we get to the lodge to iNaturalist. So we we don't carry with us a plant press, but we <laughs> actually catalog the food and what insects were on it. And then we have 
we, we link that on to our to our nodes or whatever, and then we're able to have experts identify at least to to the you know genus or whatever, and that helps us to um, kind of link that that host plant data. And then I, I use Mantis to, to keep track of <laughs> information in terms of the, the, the or molecular molecular work. <laughs> And the times that we've been in the field, when we come back, when we're there, inevitably somebody sends me a larva and, and they know that I've been working on dry thorn. So when we went to Taiwan, um, I was sent these, these larvae uh, that are dry thorn larvae. And they had um, several adults as well as PP and several instars of the, this larva. And it turns out that it's the genus Quateria forest. And you see, you see the adults on the on the, yeah, on the right with the CD on the rostrum, and the females have a shorter rostrum. So this led to the description, and we also had host, uh, host plant data. So this was the first report uh, of that. Um, and the same thing happened uh, for St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. There was a a weevil larva that was attacking. Uh, an endemic agave that's actually under threat. And in St. Croix, it's only present on the northeastern part of the island in very small clusters. Um, but they were finding that there were these beetles that were killing other agave and some of the endemic agave in the, on the island. So there was concern that there was this new pest that arrived in the US Virgin Islands and that would devastate the remaining um, agave garciana. So they wanted to know if this was Cyphophorus equipuntatus. Um, so I went on and, and, hey, well, maybe I'll go ahead and describe this larva, um, try to see if, if there's resources. And uh, since the 1924, uh, we've had people publishing on uh, Perectorian larvae. So I went and uh, looked at these resources and they were, they were great, but in some cases, the terminology was a little bit mixed. And so some of them use different types of terminology for different for the same structure, uh, particularly for the epipharynx. That was one kind of sticking point. So then I go down this avenue and this uh, kind of rabbit hole. And then I started to compare, okay, we're gonna try to determine the terminology and the homology of these different structures. We're gonna have to look at the epipharynx of all the dark triathorines. So um, in our in our at the USNM, we actually have a fantastic collection of of uh, beetle larvae. And so I started with that, started looking at that. And in dry thorns, because they are pests, we have a very nice selection, or at least a, a very nice record of um, larval associations with, your, with their adults. Um, that in, back then it was about 20, 26 or so genera that we knew what, what the larvae looked like. And then the Natural History Museum in London also has a very nice spirit collection. And so when I visited there, I went through through it and they actually had some very nice sort of old world genera that we didn't have in the USNM collection. So he, on the bottom, that's a picture of um, the slides that we that we have and the way that we prepare the mouth parts to, to study them. And this is this is what we use. These are some of the methods for, for larval study. Um, so once we dissect them, uh, clear them, put them under the slide, then we can take a camera loose to illustrate them. So these are pencil drawings of so the head capsule on the left, the mouth parts uh, are on top, and then the, the larva head and body and the right side slide. And then those scan pencil drawings are then I, I then use uh, Adobe Illustrator to then render them. And that's what then goes into the uh, publication. So the other thing that I really wanted to make sure was that there would be no more ambiguity as to what a particular structure is. So all of my illustrations and all of my plates are um, detailed um, terminology on them and what things are. And ketotaxy is highly important for, for all uh, immature uh, autonomy. And then, so these are just some examples of some of the terminology and what we looked at. So, so this is, this is uh, the epipharynx again, and this is where a lot of people have been 
debating a lot of uh, whether some structures were or not a particular SIGA or not. <laughs> so, uh, more or less, that's been resolved. Some examples of the different sporacular morphology of the larval uh, dryothorines. So, we try to include all the different aspects of um, dryothorine and larval morphology. So, the three papers came out of this kind of slight rabbit hole. Um, the, the Cyphophorus acupunctatus and Agave Garciana. The description of the immature stages of the forest and is recognized as one of the best papers with the polyacrid bulletin. And then the illustrated synoptic key and comparative morphology of 36 genera uh, of Garcerini. And so this combined all of those different papers that I showed uh, into one, um, and it included detailed illustrations. Um, as well as a key. So it wasn't just a dichotomous key, but I attempted to do a type of paper uh, lucid key. <laughs> so it's, it's called synoptic key, where you have the state and the characters, with, or the character and the different states, and then you indicate which decks that have them. Um, and so I illustrated each one of those states here. Um, and then each one of the uh, graphs are in general, uh, all of them out first were illustrated. Okay, so now changing gears here. I also have another research program in Hawaii. And so I was in Hawaii and all of a sudden there's dry fluorines in Hawaii. I didn't know this because we don't know much about what's in Hawaii. Um, so as part of my Weebles of the Hawaiian Islands um, project, um, I've been trying to catalog what weevils are in Hawaii because we have, of course, interceptions um, in Hawaii that then are sent to us, but there's no resources to, to even know what's there. So this is a project that, that we started. So um, there's 451 it weevils in Hawaii, of which 344 are endemic. Um, and 103 are, are non-native. And of the endemic weevils, they fall within five subfamilies, including the dry Sorini. No, back. Is that a weevil there with the long antennas? Yeah, so that's an antribid. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so there's uh, the antribidae and the velids, and then the Cochulonidae. And this is actually a paper that will soon come out, um, just cataloging, or it's, it's an annotated checklist of all the entrobids and the bellids and the fruitsleonids, but trying to also um, reconcile the names because there's been a lot of synonymies and uh, that, that just continue to be propagated. And so we're trying to clear that up. There's also a lot of extinct species that we're trying to understand. So when we were doing field work uh, in Hawaii, uh, yeah, when we actually found them, they're Pryothorus and they're underneath the bark, uh, as we expected. So that was wonderful. There's 12 species in Hawaii, uh, 19 in total in the Hawaiian Islands. So these are some illustrations or pictures of, of Dryothorus that are endemic to Hawaii. And then when I visited the museum in, in Honolulu, I went through their their agenda and that's what came back. So all of those almost 10 boxes that's filled with undetermined dryothorines or dryothorus um, that await um, identification. And nobody except for Alan Samuelson, maybe a few other, you know, two other people can identify these little eagles. So that's a project that has I have kind of veered into, uh, but it's, it's gonna be a lot of fun just because the last person to actually see these were our seal Perkins. And as part of the project, um, we'll be, we, we actually are databasing and creating um, species pages, if you will, for each species with the symbiotic portal. And um, we enter all of the data, uh, all the sources, and, and everything is accredited and it's all carbon, carbon for standard. And um, it just makes it easy to share and to search. So um, with the Hawaiian, uh, project, you'll be able to go into Symbiota and just look for whatever species and what collection actually has those species, so you can track it down. So this is just all the Pupilians so far, 
this is an old slide, but but there's also the non-natives. So we have Rhabdocelopsis first, the New, New Guinea sugarcane weevil, that's in Hawaii. And then we actually have two, two new records of dry thorines uh, that are not native to, to Hawaii um, that we'll be publishing in this, in this one uh, checklist. And then we have an Amasius metros that's in Hawaii, but it's been kind of a problem because for the longest time, um, Metamastus nipturus has been considered to be either one species with three subspecies or three species. So with um, Luciano Palmieri, he was interested in understanding the limits of Metamastus. So I sent him material uh, and we collaborated on understanding the limits of Metamastus nipturus. So this is a, a pest of banana and sugarcane. It's called a silky cane weevil. So um, he did a reduced genome representation using restricted site associated DNA sequencing, RAT-seq. And I'll, I'll send you to, to Luciano to explain all the methods. Um, but what's awesome is that um, we were actually able for the first time to suggest or present data or evidence that that um, Metamastius hemipterus consists of two species. So um, the three, there are three subspecies. One of them is now a junior synonym of Metamastius cerasaus, and Metamastius cerasaus is now elevated to species status. And then we have Metamastius cerasaus and Metamastius hemipterus, and we can see the polymorphism that has confused a lot of um, what this with this species is. And on a side project with Luciano is we're trying to understand what role Nardonella, Nardonella, this is meningo symbiont, um, what role it's playing on uh, melanization of these weevils. So that's kind of a, a side project with that, as well as the genome um, of, of, the, of, of the species. So we've gone through a lot about dry fluorines. So we had the first phylogeny of Dryothorini, so we'll improve the classification. It's just the first step. The next step is bigger, broader, more comprehensive, and that's in the works right now with Bruno. So we'll bring more uh, more information soon about that. Uh, but what has been clear is that morphology is not in you know, that there's a lot of uh, convergence, and so that's uh, some of the characters that we've been using to differentiate um, the different genera and the different tribes, subtribes are not, is not working. Um, but then we also very importantly want to understand the limits of Rhynchophorus. Is it Rhynchophorus dynamis? What's going on there? And this is a very important uh, genus. So, um, so, but right now it looks like it might not be monophyletic. Um, right for our diversified in the Cenozoic. We have a lot of interception data. It's been very useful for, for some of my understanding of uh, how things are coming in. Um, a lot of larval uh, new descriptions of new spread for and larvae uh, with uh, new resources and tools. And then some of the work that we've been doing with metamousias and understanding species level um, limits of these species. And then we have new genera, new larvae, new, new synonyms to discover in this client. Uh, so like I said before, uh, Mark Hoddle brought it up. So Rincoffer is a big one. We continue to look into that. So we're writing a big um, paper uh, um, that's going to be published in Annual Review and Entomology on Rincoffer. And then that also brought on this question about the validity of Rincoffer's lobatus and Rincoffer's distinctus, which are also Southeast Asia species that haven't really been explored and they, they, they're, they're known from a single specimen, the type specimen, which is in Leiden. So that's my next trip, um, the phylogenomics of Garifarini with Bruno, um, the, the genome with uh, Palmieri, and, um, and then a new collaboration with folks in the UAE, United Arab Emirates, and NYU on comparative population genomics of, again, the Rincoffers. with um, continue with the dry thorining of the world. And I wanted to kind of give a little plug or, or thanks to Tyana Litwack. And she's been creating 
these plates for me of all of the different genera of dryochlorines. So this is an example of Macrochiris that actually won her uh, a very nice illustration award. And so every genus will have at least this, where you have a lateral dorsal and a ventral view, and then some detailed morphological um, study of, of, of different organs and different characters that are diagnostic. So thanks, Haina. And with that, I want to say thanks. And that's an example of a protocerea and how this is something we can get. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Uh, what's the fauna like in the US? Do we have any species that are out here? Yeah, so Spinophorus is actually quite diverse here, more diverse than anywhere else, in fact. So Patricia Bori did the revision of spinophers, and so you can find those in fruit grass, uh, kind of crawling around, and we actually have a very nice, um, I, I think they're quite charismatic. But um, the larvae are well known too. Um, maybe half of them are known by the larvae. The Brinkahorus palmarum and Corantata, so there's two species. Some might say that palmarum is not native. It might be coming in once in a while, uh, but Corantata, so that big black one, we have that. And we have one species of Dryphorus, a tiny one. So if you do leaf litter sifting, you'll get that one species of Dryphorus. Um, and then a few. Um, than Rhodobinus. So if you have Joe Ivy in your yard, which all of you should, <laughs> um, they come to Joe Ivy and they are red and black. They're about a centimeter and a half. And they're really, really, there's two or three species of Rhodobinus. And those are, you can look out for those and you can find them very, very readily. When you say they come to it, is they complete their life cycle? That I don't know for sure. Um, they've been associated with several different host plants, uh, one of them being Joe Pie Weed, uh, but I don't know if they complete their entire well, uh, But we have Joe Pie Weed at home, and it came. it came to the plant. So, but we haven't, I, I didn't dissect it to see if the larva is there. So, what's with it? Club like terminal segment, functionally speaking, why why do they have those? There's one you showed that looked like frisbees. Yeah, I think amazing. I think I did show. So that's the genus Cercidoceros, and it has like these two booties. I call it like boots at the end. And I've seen videos of those, and they they actually move them up and down. They sit on the leaves, and they just kind of put their their head and the rostrum down, but the antennae are up. I haven't looked at them enough in the field to know what they're doing with their antennae. Um, there's been some studies about uh, receptors. And so, so the thing about the club is that you have the basal segment that's labrous, and then the apex of the, set, the, 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 the club has all of these CD or receptors on them. So I'm not entirely sure, but they, they are attracted to pheromones, of course. Um, that's how we actually try to control them. So uh, I don't know, it might have to do that, but. The polyvalent pheromone is a, a male produce? Or. That I'm not entirely it? sure, but we do use it for uh, tracking it, tracking and collecting. That's how actually they were able to. to... Yeah, Don, it's a male produced um, aggregation pheromone for these big okay. weevils. Yeah, yeah, that would be typical. Yeah. 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 So you showed just one species, black and white, very striking. Which yeah, beautiful. Cup-like enlargements to the apical segment. Is that what you were referring to? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first adosaurus, yeah. The uh, yeah. apical segment was a just large, flat cap. Yeah. What's what's that, what's that used for? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, some, must be some, is only the males have the really, really big ones for that uh -huh. group? Um, I think that's also been part of the confusion with Cercidacers and some of these other genera. I think it might be. Um, it hasn't been quite explored. 
But it starts at us, there's actually just, there's a huge explosion of them in Southeast Asia. So um, there's, hasn't been any revisions of that group, but I'm the last person who studied them only said German. And so that's why I went to address them to study types. Does the size and shape thing kind of vary with the species in the genus? Or? Yes. Okay, yeah, so a little bit, but not much. I think, um, at least for that group, I haven't studied Cercidocers, and those are the most exaggerated ones, right? Sure. Um, but different species do do have different sizes, and that might actually be a diagnostic character for for Cercidocer. Yeah. Super so question. Uh, what are your thoughts on usefulness of synoptic plus what polyphase versus normal synoptic? Yeah, I've been kind of trying to determine that myself. I I would be great for someone to use my synoptic key, a lucid key, and then a regular dichotomous key, and tell me your key sucks. You know, or sorry, your your key's like awful. I I can't identify anything. But the reason I really like the synoptic key that's different from using the dichotomous key for the larvae, just just that that as an example, is that when I was looking specifically at, you know, you look at the, the spiracles and you see, well, this, these spiracles are completely different. Rincophora's larval spiracles are completely different from spinoferine spiracles. And I'm like, that should be the first thing in the couplet. Or what if, you know, I just want to look at that. I want you to take me to that and just, just right now separate that out. And so the synoptic key allows you to do that. If you want to just look at the, the spiracles and you can then immediately Segregate out what that is, or right, if you want to place to start. Yeah, so you can start anywhere. So you can go. And so part of the key, what I did was all of the characters that are in gray. I think that those are the ones you should immediately go to if you want to differentiate the genera. The yeah, the genera, even the the, the tribes. I, the tribal, just go here. If, if it has this, if it doesn't have this, then immediately you, you know you have something else. Like Topolis and Trichetes are completely different from any of the other. Um, dry chlorine larvae. So if you go to one of those, the great characters, you can pinpoint to it. And then why I didn't do a lucid key that's electronic. And I think sometimes just doing, that's my own question to myself, <laughs> because it's the same thing, right? right? But but I think that sometimes going into lucid and trying to work it out, I think I like having the paper copy and the, the image is like right there in front of me and everything in one place. <laughs> and, that you can easily cheat backwards or forwards too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's an infrabit. Um, so so I, I copied this idea from an infrabit key uh, for New Zealand infrabits. Um, and and I just really, I really like that, that, that style. And so I tried it out and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, so please give me feedback. It's particularly helpful when you have like a damaged specimen, for example, missing for, feet or just Yeah, like, absolutely. Style, right? Absolutely, yeah. Like if you just have the head, especially for right. the kind of work that we do, right. where sometimes you just get a piece of it. So, yeah. There was a question online, I think. Did Mark have a question? Oh, well, he had a hand raise, but it's not, you know. A lot of these are like really brightly colored. Are they yeah. aposematic or why, why are some so brightly Why red? Are they, yeah, I, think, plants? I think it might have to do with camouflage, maybe. Um, although I don't know why Rotovenus would be so black and black and red around here. Um, I mean, like the you know, kids are the natural predators, apparently. Um, the first two is oh, birds. I think they look similar to milk, maybe. No. I haven't tasted them. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Yeah. Oh, these are from. So, how do you collect these very alcohol buildings? I've, I've ruined a lot of things. Uh, these are easy. Weevils. Is there any uh, trick easy. to? Um, 
These are actually soft-ish, soft-ish, but, um. So a lot of them were card-mounted in the closet. Well, those are, those are actually, were not very far, right? oh, okay. except for the one on the right. Um, but in Europe, they tend to card-mount every, all the Beatles. So. Um, not anymore. Uh, now they've, they've moved to white mounting. Uh, mostly, not the big ones. Uh, I've seen some pretty big really? needles in, in card mounts. Okay. Yeah, because the thing is that they like to put the legs out. Oh, sure. From what I understand, and and really display them in a pretty way. But the way I just collect them and I put them in alcohol. Got them later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the way. That's the way that that we collect. These guys don't seem to have a lot of senior pile or senior stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think the ones okay. with the most CD are the, the ones that live in the leaf litter. Then there's the ones that have CD at the center of the roster. Well, the patterning is the best. Well, I don't beautiful. think any of them have. Yeah. Like I mean, the red and black. Mm -mm. That's all. Just keep the white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all beautiful. There's some actually that have some of the African dry um, florins. They have these sort of plate-like scales, it seems. And um, I don't have too many of those, so I haven't tried like scraping off um, those scales. But and then that's what causes the the color, or it seems like there's some wax coming right. out of these pores. It looks like a scale, so um, that's something more. Yeah. I know there's some percolate lines that have like on scale. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Totally. It's like a true essence coming up, is that what you say? The uh, waxy yeah. substance. Scale. So, well, a lot of the dry fluorines, they have like a kind of waxy covering. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these look shiny, but the spinophorines, there's some wax covering that actually take off. But in Af the African ones actually have. And more kicked on. Yeah, I mean, it's like the in the DNA, Cibrion, and stuff that luminescence mm. covering, especially like the the ones in Namibia for collecting water on oh, the okay. elytra yeah. to funnel down. Yeah, and, yeah. But I think with they, I think it was looked at if there was some species level variance in like luminescence mm. structural mm. production. That'd be very interesting. <laughs> Yes. You mentioned endosymbionts <clears throat> playing a role in pigmentation. And I think it was the previous slide there. Um, do you know anything about that mechanism? Why does that do that? Why do they do that? No. Just no, like, but that that's a hypothesis actually. Um, oh, okay. yeah, they did we put in a grant to look at the effects of endosymbionts. Um beautiful, yeah. Colonization. So, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. But it's um, just a very different gene that creates the different patterns, maybe. So I know that you see that some some other beetle groups, some of the cotinins and the scarabs that do yeah, have multi patterns. I think they've looked into maybe, once it's and the Yeah, so they do that. Sometimes pupation also gives the. Uh, Variability in the color to the temperature sense. during pupation. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I don't know if that's the case here. No, it's these are these are amazing. You just how not just um, metamousias, but brinkhoffers as well. Like you have the black form, but then you saw a uh, picture. Yeah, so uh, of the variable uh, a variable brinkhoffer can be. So that's also caused a lot of the confusion when burning. Um, yeah, but you're not sure if endosymbionts has something to do with that or not. But right, yeah, right. Yeah, that's a big word. Yeah. I also want to ask you about the um house plants. Did you mention orchids, dendrobiums as house plants? Are they attacking the seed pods? Well, what I know about um the ones that feed on orchids, there's one um uh, parasitaris that feeds on vanilla. And it's a yeah. pest of vanilla in Madagascar. Yeah. And from what I understand, the larva is on the stem 
on the stem. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, and it looks like from what we could see in Panama, the the larva was on the stem um, of this <laughs> of that pepper plant. The pepper plant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not sure the and, dendrobium, so is it the pseudobulbs or the, the stalks or is it the seed pods or whatever? No, it's a stalk. I think it's a stalk. And dendrobium. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know the biology of that of right. the, the orchid one. <laughs> I, I know that it's been reported. I've seen a lot of vanilla growing in, in the tropics. Uh huh. But I don't know if they were attacked by any. Weed. Yeah, I mean, I've been wanting to go to Madagascar because we don't know what the larva looks like of these parasitids. Even though it's like a pest of vanilla in Madagascar, so I'm like, why don't people just send me some <laughs> parasitaria larvae in pupa, and then we can describe it and then right. understand a little bit more about its biology. Sure. I'm sure the French have done some in Madagascar, oh, yeah. but um, but one of the things, that, so regarding the life history of of these beetles, the lar I, I didn't talk about this, but so you saw early on in the pictures, the larva takes the fibers of the, the palms and uh, right before pupation, it forms this cocoon. Mm -hmm. So that's what you saw there. And what I think is kind of the, the unifying sort of characteristic of the plants that these beetles prefer is that they're very fibrous in this way. So you could see in the picture of the pepper, the pepper plant with the larva there, you can see kind of the, the fiber of the, of the, the stems. And so I think that what these weevils prefer is when, and you find them usually, not when you have like an agave that's beautiful and green, you'll find that when I was in Arizona, the times and the places that you find them is when the agave is about to die and it's rotting in the center. And I searched all throughout to see every agave that I went and all the green ones, nothing, not a single dark chloride, but once you could see that it, that the center was starting to, to kind of um, ferment, right? Then that's where you found all of the uh, all of the adults and the larvae okay. in there. So what's the status on the one in St. Croix, the plant uh, endangered at this point or? I think that what they found, what we found with that study, they didn't find them in the, the areas where the plants were, were, were naturally found in the eastern part of the island because that's where the climate, um, that's where they occur, right? Like that's where they were adapted to. But the plants that were brought in, so that agave garciana that was brought into the center of the, of the, of the island or that were, was in a different part of the island, the plant became stressed. And so this weevil um, came from, I think, maybe Puerto Rico or some other nearby island and um, started attacking stressed plants. and with the stress by Garciana that was in the middle of the island. But then they, they went around the rest of the island where by Garciana um, is native, you know, it's endemic to, and they didn't find the weevil there. But this is a note that I haven't uh, followed up with my colleagues about, about it, but I haven't seen anything. But this did help um, place the plant in a more secure sort of protected status. Mm -hmm. Um, because because of the threat that this particular weevil posed, so that was part of the understanding of what this weevil was and what it was doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, past president tomorrow for that wonderful talk on dry florence. Um, at this point, if there's no further business, I'd like to ask for a motion to close the meeting. So, so is there a second for that? So moved, I will close this meeting and see you next month for the 1,230 fourth meeting of the end of Washington. Have a good night.